Okay, thank you, Dan. I'd like to start by asking you to turn to somebody next to you. So if you're by yourself, just to come here to somebody. Shake them by the hand and say congratulations on being here this afternoon. <laughs> Because I know you've just come from a short lunch, but I also know it's Saturday. You know, there's many places we could be on a Saturday. But you're being here and you're investing and you're learning, trying to find out some more. And I'd like to start by just sharing with you a quote. It's one of my favourite authors. And he says, knowledge is a commodity that quickly becomes outdated. So it's your ability to keep on learning that keeps you fresh and will prepare you for the challenges that are coming up in the workplace. So just to start with, really great you're here. And I hope you'll learn a lot from today. Something about me, because I'll speak for the next hour, uh, to make it a bit more familiar. My mom is from a place called um, Goa. Have any of you been to Goa? Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if you haven't been, it's like I believe we're off India, okay? So we're going to go holiday. You know, my father's from Brazil, so they started their own projects, or maybe they were designers, or they were parents whose child had leukemia. They would start a charity for their son. So I wrote my first book, it was called Made in Britain, where I told their life stories, and that book got sponsored free for schools in this country. And I'll talk about that. How do you have an idea? How do you make it go national? How do you have, make what you do spread? And the second book I wrote was about networking. And this looked at how do you, when people say you have to network better, what do they mean? What is it that you can do to become more effective? And that book is now in 12 different languages. So I work with, it, with this thinking. I work globally, so what I'm going to share with you today isn't just um, based in the UK. So last week I was in China, the week um, in January in Australia, so I've worked from the Middle East, from Beirut to Cairo, all over the world. So I hope you will bring in that perspective as I share with you. I'm not going to lecture you. And Dan did mention my I lecture. I run the Global Executive MBA at IU Business School in Madrid. But I won't lecture you today, it's after lunch. So we want to make this interactive as far as possible. So what am I going to cover today? Just three things I hope to do. To describe what is networking? What do we mean by this thing called social capital? Which is a phrase that you probably come across in the course of the day. I'm going to explore what are the mindsets, the skill sets of people who network very effectively. What do they do and how can we learn to do something like that? And importantly, how do we maintain our network? You'll meet a lot of interesting people over the next two days. How do you stay in touch? How do you avoid having a collection of business cards that you don't follow up on? So what is it that we can do? So I'd like to start by asking you to think of somebody successful you know. I know that Chris is giving you a talk about success. So I'm not going to define that for you. But I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbour and ask you to one minute each, who is the most successful person you know in your definition? And what qualities do they have that enable them to be so successful in achieving their goals? So with a partner, if you're sitting by yourself, just join the make it free, and I'll give you two minutes. Go. So let's just hear from a couple. Because the microphones are taking hard to run up, I just ask you if you just raise your hand, I can call in you, and just to project your voice. So who's willing to share what kind of qualities came up or who they thought of? Let's get some side. Since so um, he's found what's important to him, he's created love, he's created a good family, and found happiness in the relationship. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll continue with the uh, I consider it to my dad as well. <laughs> 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 so, like, I hope it's your mum's, the mother's dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, okay. I can't um, Yeah, I think that's what I can say. I was born in 1993 and my parents were very young when the Soviet Union split. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad comes from not very poor, but just an average 
family, working class family in the Soviet Union, which is kind of was pretty poor. And uh, in and on the, because the university, the quality of university education and the perspectives and support from universities or any other organization in terms of work-wise is rubbish. It was rubbish and still kind of is. And uh, so and in 15 years, without any sort of support or extra training on mentoring, he managed to make sure that he's got family, uh, who he keeps really close in touch with. And at the same time, he made sure that me and my brother get steady here and get much better opportunities at here. Okay. So he managed to create a good life for his children and his family, even though he came from really difficult circumstances. Great example. One more? Yeah, please. Uh, well, I'm going to completely flip the script and talk about my mom. But she inspires me because she hasn't come from a very um, high class background. We're an average working class family, but she's always wanted the best for us as a family. And she's worked hard over the past few years to gain extra qualifications. She's learning at the moment to be a HR manager for her work where she works. And she really inspires me in the sense that in just one conversation she can understand people and get what they're all about, their motives, their values. And she doesn't do this to, in a bad way to gain influence or power. She does it because she's genuinely interested in other people and she wants to meet as many people as possible. And I like to think I would be able to do the same one day as well. Right, thank you. Brilliant example. So genuine interest and able to really listen and get somebody. <coughs> the qualities you've given me are so different than the qualities I get when I ask in the workplace. And I've asked in different, you know, different situations in different countries. So you know, sometimes you know, if I'm asking in Cairo, for example, they might say deep listening skills. If I'm asking in a bank in New York, they might say ruthlessness. There are different qualities that they consider to be successful. But these are some of the typical um, responses I get. So people sometimes say, not ability to manage the debt crisis or foreign policy, nothing to do with that, but communication skills, ability to speak well, or aid, and uh, a very good time communicating, despite the quality. Intelligence. You know, people say, it doesn't matter where you came from. If you're smart enough, then you succeed. Einstein being an example of somebody who's very intelligent, managed to develop that. Who's this one, guys? Exactly. So determination. You, know, you might have an obstacle at the beginning, but do you persist enough, long enough to succeed? So eventually it's the one who stays with the course that doesn't give up, that succeeds. Who's this? Mm -hmm. we're coming harder than pub quiz. Who's that one? I'm hearing whisperings, but a bit loud. Take a risk. No, I've got that chair. But someone, as in Jordan, someone said it was Sylvia Berlusconi's mother. It's not. But the clue is, the clue is, she was Italian. That's your first clue. What? She was, she was Italian. Maria Montessori. Yes, thank you. Who said that? Great. So she was the first woman to go to the College of Physicians in Rome. Education. You know, some people believe if you have the right degree, the right CFA, the right MBA, the right PhD, then you can succeed. Education. Who's this last one? <laughs> so this is Gary Blair. He was he's a, a professional golfer, and he was accused of something. What, what was he accused of for his success? Luck. Exactly, Jack. He was accused. It doesn't matter, you know, all your education, all your background, and your assistance. Were you just in the right place at the right time? It's luck. What do all of these answers have in common? And about 80% of the answers that we heard in the room. What's the one thing they all have in common? It's a hidden assumption. It's not explicit. What's that? Fame. Fame? They're successful. Maybe that's explicit. But the one hidden assumption is this, which I call the myth of individualism. It's the idea that I will be successful down to my intelligence, my determination, my communication skills, my persistence, my education, even my luck. And what I want to show you in this very short talk is that it's yeah, your efforts do count, they do matter a lot, and your relationships have a bigger impact on your success than any other factor. And we'll look at that, we'll look at how does that impact on your success.
So looking at um, Obama, he's an actual orator. He had a team of 20 people that worked under John Favreau, his first director of speechwriting, that wrote his speeches, coined his slogans, and helped him rehearse for the teleprompter. It's down to his effort, and it's also down to whole team. Einstein, what did they think of him as a child? Yeah, they thought he had a learning disability. You know, he didn't speak very much until he was about eight years old. And they showed if a teacher's told this is the cleverest class, they teach in such a way that those students' results go up. So there's an efficacy effect. It's not just um, personal. Education, depending on where you're born in the world, depending if you're a boy or you're a girl, the youngest or the oldest, your zip code, the postal code, determines what access to education you have. So it's not, I want a good education. Determination, have any of you met him? Have you heard him speak? He has a team, and they're all volunteers from 16 different countries. None of them are paid. So we tend to focus on the Polar Explorer, but there are people working for years in order to achieve an expedition. So we tend to focus on the hero. But if you watch the Oscars, how many of you watch the Oscars? Yeah? Nobody stands there saying, I'd like to bag myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they've got a whole list. They've got a whole list of people they want to acknowledge to help them achieve their success. When he was accused of luck, what did he reply? What's his famous retort? It's a bit of a cliche, but what do you think he said? Someone said, huh? So someone said to him, you're lucky. What do you think he said? He the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yeah, exactly. He so said, the more I practice and the harder I work, the luckier I get. And he was paraphrasing Louis Pasteur, the French physician. He said, fortune favours the prepared mind. And there's a psychologist here at the University of Hertfordshire who's written a business book called The Luck Factor, which is lucky people tend to do things differently, have networks that allow them to meet opportunity. And even the best performers, whether in business or in sport, have people to give them feedback to tell them what they can't see. So the point is, we know about human capital. This two days, you'll get more knowledge, you'll get more information, you'll get more skills. What I want to propose is something called social capital which is far more important in many respects, because it doesn't reside in your head, so it's got much more potential. But your social capital resides in your relationships, and it's not something fluffy, it's not like a soft skill. It's capital, it's productive, it can lead to investment, it can lead to opportunities, it can lead to goodwill, cooperation, and it can make a big difference in your career and what you want to do next. There's also data that shows people with this type of network tend to get better money, get better jobs, faster promotion than people with this structure of network. So I might briefly mention that during the course of the talk. But there's a direct correlation between your career and what kind of network structure that you build. These were the top reasons when I was researching my book, why do you want to emphasize and why do you want to focus on networking? So they're from solving problems, meeting mentors, investors, and uh, looking at the, getting a job, making a promotion, securing your first job, but also giving back to others, sharing what you know. I think it's more relevant today than ever. And this is showing the job losses in the tens of thousands in London. The top line shows a recession of the 1990 recession, the middle line is the 2001 recession, and the bottom line is the current recession. And although that line crept upwards, you know it's tripled it, almost. So there's this sense that even if we're thinking we're in a good position, it's likely that we're going to get more change. And we're only convinced there's more volatility, more uncertainty, more complexity. So the ability to form strong relationships matters now more than ever in this changing context. So what I want to do is give you something practical to take away. So I'm going to give you some tips that are hopefully, when you've left this hour's talk, you can walk out of this room thinking, okay, Steve, I've got something that will make a difference in your career and make a difference in your life. That's my intention. So I'd like to start with this question. You've seen networking and you're told to you by your friends it's a good thing to do. But I want to get what's your honest emotional response when people say the word networking to you. Let's go out networking tonight. What do you honestly feel when you hear that word? What's your honest response? What, don't give me a long definition. But what does that word conjure up for you? What pictures, what words, what do you think about the word? Be honest, don't be kind. <coughs> uh, building trust. Building trust? Okay, great. Thank you. Sleazy. Sorry, Dan. Sleazy? Sleazy? Yeah. Can you say something more? Like, uh, like if, if, if you were to say, like, oh, let's go networking, 
who means like, let's go and try and uh, get as many contacts so we can help ourselves as much as possible. Sales. Sales. Say something more sales. So it's, um, how can someone sell their service or product to you? It can be. Fear. 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 Say something more about fear. Okay. You say networking? I get sweaty and nervous. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that's, that's for me, I just get nervous and quite scared. I just checked, you're not the only one in the room, so who also gets sweaty in the atmosphere? Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, I think that's probably it. Um, yeah, I don't know it's going to sound really empty, but yeah. using other people to benefit yourself. Yeah, so using, using other people to benefit Yeah, just if you're going to say networking with other people, you're know, getting ideas from other people so that you can progress. Okay, um, You might not be apprentice, are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, back. Uh, Hey, yeah. say something more. Well, because you're all there for one reason, and you're for small talking, it's just to get up to the end. Okay. Dan, I think I'll leave now. <laughs> <laughs> you're probably the kindest group I've spoken to. Because when I'm speaking in companies, if, you know, and I ask them, what's your honest emotional reaction to the word networking? They say to me, Stephen, it's manipulative. Now, you want to get something, you're not there to, to do anything. Well, it's, stupid. it's an artificial construct for natural human relationship. Why do you want to give a label networking? Just meeting people. Why do you want to do that? Some people say it's brow nursing. It's kissing up to your boss and telling them nice things. Some people say it's you know, just hard work and a waste of time. I don't have time to go to all these events. I've got enough of, in my day. I've got enough time. I don't even have enough time to see my friends. And once one uh, senior woman of a big bank, I asked, what do you feel when you hear the word networking? She went, uh, and her whole body started to shake. She said, Stephen, I feel awkward. I feel nervous. I don't like meeting new people. I don't know how to make small talk, and I find it awkward to leave. So this, I have a friend, he calls himself a networker. People call him a brat. Yeah? <laughs> so this is like the kind of thinking, you know, the kind of thinking. So the first thing when I was researching my book is I thought, why is it we have this idea that networking is like this? And it's because of the kind of behaviours that we've seen at so-called networking events or opportunities. So these are characters, but see if you can recognise some of these in people or behaviours that you see. Or maybe even in our own behaviour. So the first character called Marketing Martin, similar to what you were saying, is not somebody there with a briefcase and widgets or phones, but you've met somebody. Have you ever met someone just to convince you? They're just there to convince you their point of view, what they want to do. And if you're not interested, they quickly leave you alone. Have you met that? They won't give you the card, they you're not useful. Or, have you ever met someone that just goes along to a network event for the drinks and the cannabis? Yeah. <laughs> they go for the food, and they come with the friends they came with, and enjoy the food, but they'll leave with the friends they came with. They haven't met anybody new, or spoken to anybody different. Have you ever met someone who's told you all about their life? Yeah. <laughs> all about their university, all about their struggles, their, their job, but they haven't asked you one question about you. It's all about being, all about what they're doing. Well, on the other side, have you shared something about you? you know, you've told them about what you do, what you should, then you ask them, you know, tell me about you, what's happening with your life? Nothing. No, they won't share, it's not equal. Does anyone know who the woman at the top corner is? Her name is Sam Carol Stone, and um, she's said to be by the even standards in her lifetime the most connected woman in Britain. And uh, most connected woman in Britain. And I met this woman in January, and it was in, in near, near the tube station in St. Paul's. And I was, I was doing an event, it was like an auction for the Big Issue magazine, a uh, homeless magazine. And it was late at night, it was coming up to 11, and I was walking to the tube. And I was going along, and then suddenly I had and a tap on my shoulder. And I thought, oh shit, this is the first time I'm going to get mugged in London. <laughs> <laughs> I had to it was this woman, she's very tall, and I'm, maybe I'm shorter. She was six foot three. I looked up, and she said to me, I'm so sorry I didn't get to meet you here this evening. I said, don't worry, I never expected to meet you. <laughs> there were 400 people at this uh, auction. She said, I'd really like to connect with you. 
So she gave me her card, and the next day I got an invite to Covent Garden, where she has something called Salon, which is a French concept, where every month she gathers six to eight people to talk about an issue that's relevant for that day. So she'll get a politician, she'll get a business leader, she'll get somebody from education, and they might speak about entrepreneurship, or they might speak about health care, or they might speak about microfinance. But she adds real value by connecting these different perspectives through a very thorough dialogue. And every year she has a Christmas party. I don't know if some of you have been, maybe. In Hoban, over three nights, she invites thousands of her closest friends. And there'll be everyone, you know, from actors to students to nurses. But she's able to meet people and very quickly say, Damn, I know that you're involved in ISA. You have to be shy. Who's actually from this healthcare charity that I think could be a good partnership to form? So she went bridges that add value by connecting people that normally wouldn't connect. So she's very successful. She's got 40,000 people in her active network. So I'm going to use this as a model of her networking and a definition I want you to bear in mind just for this session. It's not about being false, but it's about being true to your character, your values, your belief, building and also nurturing reciprocal relationships. So it's not just one way. They help you achieve or help the group achieve a goal. So there's a purpose behind it. Carol, who's much more successful than me, has another definition. Her definition of networking is, networking is the art of making friends. The art of making friends. That's from one of the most connected women in Britain. So I'd like to bear that in mind. If it is the art of making friends, why don't we do it? Why is it so difficult? These were the common myths I came across that prevent us from networking. The first thing we talked about is the belief of networking. We know we have friends who manipulate us. We tend not to do anything, go out of our way to support them. And we know reputations based on trust, relationships based on trust. It's only for socialites. It's okay if you're confident and you're an extrovert. I'm an introvert. Who else is an introvert in this room? You prefer to be by yourself? Yeah. yeah. There's a recent book, it's a business book by an author called Suzanne Kane. It's called Quiet. It's called Introvert Advantage. She's done a study of people within business at the senior levels. The majority of them are introverts. You can never like anywhere and even online. It doesn't require you to be an extrovert. Hard work takes too much time. You know, knowing the right person who can help you with a job interview, who can help you with an assignment at university or at work, can save you weeks, months, hours of time reaching goals faster. Only for graduates. I work a lot with them as senior managers, directors, CEOs. The higher you go in your career, the less you're promoted on your technical knowledge, the less they care about what you know specifically, but you're promoted about your ability to build relationships with your shareholders, with your board, with your management team. So the ability to network matters more the higher you go in your career. Nobody to network with, you know, I'm quite alone. You know, ISEC is a great example, JCI as well. Opportunities to meet people from across the globe and not just within your own area. I can be successful alone? I believe nobody can be. You know, from birth, we rely on somebody to survive. And then um, we talked about relationship being one of the key areas of success. You can always benefit from others' experience. So this is something to give you maybe a different mindset about networking and dispel some of the myths. So let's go into something practical now. How do you connect? And how do you make a good first impression, make a strong connection with somebody, and then we'll look at how do you grow and maintain the network. So first impressions, a study was done about first impressions. And this was for a global um, company, so it's not culturally specific. It's not in Malaysia, we look for this, or in, um, in India, we look for this, or in the um, Middle East, we look for this, or in Europe, we look for this. This was senior managers in international companies they will ask the question, what do you think are the first four things that make a positive first impression when we present a candidate to you for interview? What do you notice is the top things? So what do you think was the top thing that made a positive first impression? What did they notice? Smile. Smile. Was it smile? That's high up the list. Well, it's not the first Eyes. The eyes was the like. Are the bright eyes bright and clear? Or they more dull? Or they're just not interested? You know, they're called the windows of the soul. You can tell within milliseconds whether somebody's somebody's there with them. 
Second thing, you said? Yeah, it's a warm, genuine, open smile or more for grownups. Okay, we're going to do a quick exercise. For this, you need a partner. Can everybody just sit next to somebody quickly? <laughs> Can you find somebody to sit next to? Okay. Who has a kind of partner? Just raise your hand. Okay. Okay. So this is what I want you to do. One of you is A, one of you is B. A, your job is to smile with the biggest smile that you've ever given and look into the eyes of B. B, B, your job is to look into the eyes of A and keep a straight face for seven seconds. You can't, you can't smile back. Are you ready? Screen and then somebody kicks the football and hits somebody in the sensitive, and everyone goes, ah, oh, at the same time. <laughs> it didn't happen to them, but we respond automatically. So these emotions are contagious. You know, if you're smiling, if you're smiling, it's, it's very hard for somebody to go. They have to try to keep um, a, a, a more closed face. Handshake, something I got you to do at the very beginning of the talk. Do you remember? Yeah. So we're going to do a quick experiment. For this, you need a partner again. And I want you to shake your partner's hand, but I only want you to use 10% of your energy, so it's like this. And as you shake their hand, I want you to reflect on this question. What's your experience of the character, character of somebody who offers you a 10% handshake? Are you ready? Shake hands, go. 10%. <laughs> Shy, fake, weak, 
less enthusiastic to meet you. Less, less enthusiastic to meet you. It doesn't have confidence. Last one. Well, just imagine that you know, they're your best friends and you haven't seen them for one year. You're reconnecting with 110% energy, but not strength. You know, strength is like this. <laughs> like in Spain, we kiss on the cheek or you can high five. Or, I don't want you to do that. One hand, but with the warmth of energy of reconnecting with a great friend. Shake hands. Go. Somebody who offered you that handshake. Confident, enthusiastic, that they love you. <laughs> interested, willing. So these are your words. Weak, disinterested, creepy. No, half hearted, polite, doesn't really want to be there. Incompetent, enthusiastic, warm, um, that they like you. This has nothing to do with the handshake, nothing. If I'm working in Japan, I would bow. If I'm working in the Middle East, in a Muslim, in a Muslim country, and they might not be appropriate from gender to shake hands, I wouldn't. I'd be culturally appropriate to who I'm with and where I am, context. But this has something to do with every day, even at the beginning of this talk. Do you remember how I got you to shake hands? And how differently people perceive you on your intention, and how they received you, how they make an assessment. These aren't rocket science things. These are things we can all control. Eyes, smile, touch, intention. Yeah. Discrimination doesn't happen in big things. Communication happens in small things. How do we bring more awareness to these everyday ways of making contact? What was the last one on the list? Yeah. It's not saying expensive, it's just saying are they clean. Okay, so don't go to that interview with the, with the dirty shoes. So if you imagine you've communicated well, you've made a good first impression, how do you make a strong relationship with someone? How do you make it so that they feel they know you? Well, the research says this. It says we come together on our similarity. We come together when we look for similarity. So how many of you are sitting next to somebody you knew before you came here today? Be honest. Put your hand up if you're sitting next to somebody you knew. Yeah, we tend to gravitate automatically, unconsciously, towards similarity. I work with international groups, and within a few minutes, the Russian speakers are next to the Russian speakers, the Latin speakers are next to the Latin, those who are interested in finance sitting next to the finance people. It tends to go to autonomy. This happens naturally, even on gender or culture lines. And that's the real mistake, because you're going to miss out on the benefit of being in a diverse group over the next two days, and the value that you're able to get from that. So we come together on our similarity. The trick is, it's not the quality of similarity that counts. I can find one thing in common with you, and then we're going to run out of conversation, right? So we need to, it's the quantity that goes relationship. Can I find something else in common with you? Can I find something else in common with you? So I find the best people who are good at networking have different interests. That they're able to generally find points in contact. Somebody said to me, I once thought, to be a good communicator, you just need to ask open questions. And just get interested in the other person. Face Sophia. And observe Sophia. Now, Julia, could you turn away so you can't see Sophia? Yeah, great. Now, Sophia, can you make three small, silent, and subtle changes to your appearance? Three small, silent, and subtle changes. So, could you take? <laughs> could you make a. Yeah, change the three things. Three small, silent, or subtle. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> if you wish. <laughs> okay, and one more, please. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, 
Julia, would you turn around, please? And can you spot Sabir's three small silence subtle <laughs> <laughs> It is harder than it looks. Let's take a guess for one. <laughs> so can you tell what were your three? I took my ring off and put it there. I put my scarf off and put it there. Put my hair on this side. And your boots. Can you give them both a pat, please? I think you know, that shows it's much harder than it actually seemed, right? For us, it was obvious for us, we could see what the changes were. But often, you know, we can look what we don't see. How many of you have seen the Joshua Bell YouTube video? Have you seen the video? Yeah? Can you say what it's about? Um, he's playing at a train station. Yes. Um, and you see many passengers. Oh, oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because what do they see? What do they think they see? Before they just saw a normal bus car. Yeah, a bus car. But instead, it's a world-class violinist, you know, and only one person stops and hears. You're, you're Joshua Bell, aren't you? You're, 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 you're um, playing a concert here this evening. Why? We just passed because we tend to see a label. We tend to see a face. That's not. We don't see that individual. I once gave this, and the, the manager from his bank said, "I went home to my wife. I said, darling, that's a beautiful new dress. She said, love. I've had this for ten years. So be careful, be careful how you use the compliments. Okay, that you really see." We frighten what we chase. How many of you have friends who only call you when they need something? How does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, it is, right? So we start to develop relationships when we don't need something. We think this is a sigmoid curve. It's from Charles Handy. It shows a career path. And it shows people get, getting better in their career, they may be going down. And there's two points, A and B. Where do you think most people start to build their network? Point A or B? B, yeah. Things aren't going so well. I'm not getting the job I thought I would get. You know, maybe something is not, I'm not learning anymore. Start, you start to build your network at point A, when things are going okay, and they could get better actually, but you're building now for your next role, what do you want to do 18 months from now, 12 months from now? So you're building the relationships when you don't need something. So building contacts for our next job, developing contacts for what we want to do next. So I worked in one area of the bank and I wanted to work within private banking. So I did, there was no jobs advertised, but I asked the director, can I meet you for a coffee? Find out about what you do. When a job came there, I was able to move there. Or I was in finance, and so I wanted to work in education. So I went along to a free event like this. It was an angel at the Business Design Centre. And um, it was about entrepreneurship. And they offered a scholarship to study for a master's degree in Madrid. And one of my friends, he applied, and he got the scholarship. So I went to visit him and, um, in Madrid. And I decided to knock on the door of the professor and say to him, you gave a really good talk. I like the way that you teach. I didn't have to say that. And he said to me, I appreciate you coming to tell me this. I'd like you to come back and speak to my MBA students. I said to him, I don't have an MBA. So I don't mind. I think you've got something of value to say. So I built a relationship with that business school over a course of two years. And then they created a job for me. I can live anywhere in the world and they would employ me as a, as a fellow. So this is thinking about what do you want to do next? How do you start to go along to free events, building those relationships that you need for your next, uh, next move? And building weak ties outside of your immediate context. You've heard of expression weak ties? Have you come, any people studying sociology in here? Sociology, I won't call the pressure of you working. But the weak ties, it comes, from a, it comes from a phrase from sociology, do you know? <laughs> okay. So idea, strong ties of people you know very well. You've got strong emotional connection. Weak ties of people you know, but not so well. And there's like people in this room that you might not know very well. So they did a study on jobs. Where do you think job opportunities came from? Strong ties or weak ties? Weak ties, yeah. Why? 
Why are you being touched? Maybe because of this general rule of not making business with your close friends. Yeah, it can be. In some cultures, um, some countries, it's uh, they have family business or it's who you know. But in general, most opportunities come from weak ties. Why? Because people we know very well tend to know many of the same people we know, right? You have friends in common. Therefore, have access to the same opportunities or knowledge, or information, or resources that you already have access to. People you don't necessarily well know people that you're not even aware of and have much more that's outside. And there's many more of them. To maximize that, you need to know the answer to this question. Do you know who's the center of the universe? No, don't say narcissistic, come on. <laughs> no, Ben, it's not you. Some of you will see this advert. Have you seen the advert? <laughs> You've seen it, right? If you, if you haven't seen it, this, this is um, Kevin Bacon. I think it's E.E. -E. And it shows Oracle of Bacon. Have you heard of Oracle of Bacon? It's actually in the computer science department in the University of Virginia in America, and this, this um, department measures how every other actor or actress is connected to Kevin Bacon. So you've heard of the six degrees of separation, right? Yeah. Sandy Milgram experiment. He said he tried to get two parcels across the United States, well, many, but only two right. He said the six degrees for separating anybody on the planet. This looks at how Kevin is connected to every other actor or actress in the Hollywood database, and there's millions of them. So if I'm Kevin Bacon, I have a Bacon number of naught. Okay, if I've worked on a film with him, I have a Bacon number of one. If I've worked on a film with somebody who's worked with him, I have a Bacon number of two. Now, there's millions of actors and actresses. Give me a Hollywood actor or actress who is unusual that you can spell. Jodie Foster. Jodie Foster, okay. Jodie Foster. What do you think Jodie Foster's Bacon number is? One. If you say one, you have to tell me the name of the film. Two? <laughs> 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 That's a cop out. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> Jody Foster's bacon number is two. Oops, I don't know what all that other thing is on the machine. But five, um, there's the five corners with Tim Robbins, there's the mystic corner with Kevin Bacon. Now, going back into the 1940s, you remember Charlie Chaplin? What do you think his bacon number would be going back you know, six decades, seven decades? Can you take a guess? Four. Four. Six. It's the bacon number of three. No? Countess of Tokyo Hedron Castle from Hong Kong with James Mantle Carl with Kevin Bacon. The point is he's connected to millions of people through very short chains. And let me see if I can get back to my presentation here. Let me, let me do that. I think we've lost it. Sorry. That's it. Could you just play that? Great. So basically, he's thanked them. He's connected to millions of people through very short chains. He's not the most connected person in Hollywood. You know, people are more connected than him. But he's in the top 1%. Why? Does anyone know why? He's a character actor. So people have made more films than him, but maybe they're all action films or all horror films. Can you, can you name some of the films he's done? Visible Man, Footloose, Friday the 13th, Apollo 11, Flat Riders, Sleepers. He does across different genres. He connects people because he does that across different genres. So this is something um, to think about. What makes a network valuable is a network that connects across disconnects. See, he's one of the most connected persons because he's done that. Now, Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote The Tipping Point, have any of you read that book? He talks about, uh, he wrote an article in The New Yorker. So who's the most connected woman in Chicago? She's an 85-year-old woman called Louise Gladwell. Uh, sorry, Louise, um, Louise Weisberg. And he said, why is she the most connected person? She connects thousands of people. He said, because she's lived among the art lovers. She's lived among the female haciendas. She's lived among the hospitality people. She connects across different genres, and that's what makes her so powerful. How many of you are on LinkedIn? 
Yeah, right. If you're not, I encourage you to join. It's not the value of your network that counts, but it's two degrees away, 139,000 people. Three degrees away, six million people, just three degrees away from me. Why does LinkedIn stop at three? The number at four should be huge. It's huge, but they can calculate it. Why it stops at three is they show networks degrade. The, the power tends to lose after three degrees. In three degrees, the chain isn't broken. Either I know my contact, or my contact's contact knows somebody, but the, there's, the chain isn't broken. So there's somebody who knows somebody directly in that network. So it's quite powerful to think that within three degrees, you can reach six million people. So we tend to underestimate the value of our network. Tip five is increased availability. It's not, it's not who you know. It's not who you know. It's who knows you. How can you become more visible? It's much easier. You know, LinkedIn, speaking at conferences. How many of you have spoken at a conference before? Okay, great. How many people were at the conference you spoke at? How many people? Yes. Depends. Just choose one. Uh, 300. So it's unlikely that you met every all 300, but it's likely they all knew who you were because you were speaking. Writing articles, again, that helps you get your view out. I wrote for something called Here is the City. Went out 100,000 people a few times a week. So it's impossible for me to know so many people, but it's possible for them to know me by using the written word. Volunteering on things like ISEC, volunteering when you meet at work across cross functions. Tip four, consistently add value to your network. This is one of my former colleagues. She thought about people who could help her in her promotion. And if all of these people could have a say, why is she only spending all her time here? She decided to add value twice a week to two people. It doesn't sound like much. But over the course of a month, she's added value 10 times. In the course of a year, 120 times, she got promoted. She even thought about people who do her job in other companies. So she wasn't just thinking about her own, own, her own career. How did she add value? She got really personal. She would discover what are they interested in? What do they care about? She would send along an article, and maybe some information, maybe a conference. If she was offered an opportunity, she wouldn't decline it. But she would see, who else can I pass this opportunity to in my network? So for example, one of my friends, a girl who called me and said, Stephen, do you want to go to a CFA conference on business ethics? So I'm busy. But do you mind if I connect you with my friend Justine? She's a CEO of a company and she's very interested in this topic. So I'm not saying no, I'm saying I can't, but can I make a connection? And like Carol, can you let, look, when you send something, make a commentary, don't um, just forward an email, but add why do you think it's useful? Or add let them know what you're up to. So it's, it's more than an email that's forwarded, you bring something connected, something personal onto the email. It's very important. <coughs> Tip three, it's not about uh, the, the number of people. It's not about meeting new people. Networking is making the most of your existing relationships, making the most of the relationships you already have. So, for example, I worked with a group of young people uh, similar to this size, and I asked them, what do you want to do in one year? One guy, he wanted to become a start a business exporting from China. And I said, make a picture of your name, Daniel, business from China, export. What do you need to do to have your business? Put on the lines, find a product, learn about export law, learn about China. Somebody else, Diane, wanted to fly small planes. She needed to find a flying school, keep up a, a log of her hours. Somebody else wanted to learn Italian, somebody else wanted to do something else. I said, put your flip charts on the floor. And I want you to walk around the room. If you can help, write your name, how you can help. If you know somebody who can help, write who do you know who can help. Ten minutes later, all those flip charts were full. One woman was from China, who recommended Daniel to speak to her family, learn about export and their business. One woman, her brother, had a pipe slices, could recommend Biggins to Airfield, how he kept up the log. The point is, remember, six million, just three degrees away. If you don't know something, it's likely somebody in this room can connect you. So how do you share? What is it you want to achieve over the next two days? How do you share with each other? The fastest way from A to B is not to go directly, to go through somebody who can connect you, somebody that you ask, can, I, can you make an introduction? Going cold, 2%. Goes to 15 if you ask for a name, if you name drop. 
if you ask somebody, can you endorse me prior and then follow up? It goes to 15%, so much higher. Never too late. Try and follow up immediately after, then within a week, and then within a month. Try and vary it. So if you do coffee, then do an email, then do lunch, or do Skype. But don't do the same thing again and again. Like research shows that the more variety you win, the more closer the relationship. Better late than never. It's useful to keep in touch with people that you've lost touch with because they become weak ties. They have access to information that you no longer have. And lastly, make it personal. Think about birthdays. Think about moments of contact so you have that person in mind. So it's not generic but that your contact is personal. And to finish, networking isn't about networking events. Networking happens always and everywhere. So a few years ago, I was the director of a charity called the Winter Fellowship. Have any of you come across this? as a junior fellowship program. It was for young people from minority communities, and it was to help them become senior managers in companies rather than get stuck in the middle. And often I would hear in the media this complaint, which says there's a lack of positive role models for young people from different cultures. And for me, that's not true. I know people who are inspiring to me, it's just I think their story isn't being told. I think we only have the negative stories in the media. So I said, let me tell the stories of people I know who are inspiring to me. Half of them were from my hometown, in Luton. They're not famous, they were like people I know. So what I decided to do is, how do I tell the stories? Let me write a book. I've not written a book before, but I had an email by one of my friends. And I saw this person had written a book. So I decided to send them an email on their website, saying, I see you've written a book. Can you meet me for coffee? What's the worst thing that he could say? No. What's my percentage of success? 2%, right? Cold calling, too. So I met him. He said yes. I met him outside Angel Tube Station, Cabbage Coffee Shop. So Jonathan, you know, you're in your mid-20s. You're similar age to me, and you've got a book by Penguin. How did you do that? You know, do you have family and publishing, friends, contacts? He said, Stephen, no. I none of these things. I just sent an email to the publisher saying, I've got a good idea. Will you need for coffee? <laughs> Can't be that easy. So I went back to my desk in Hackney and I sent an email to Penguin and I decided to use the second technique, name dropping. So I said, Rachel, Jonathan recommended I speak to you. I've got a good idea. Will you meet me for coffee? What's the worst thing that could happen? She could? No? My percentage of success? 15? Good. So I met her on Victoria Street outside in the Army and Navy, House of Fraser Coffee Shop, second floor. She said, and I was a bit there. She said, what do you want? I said, I want to write a book to inspire young people. She said, Stephen, you do know we're a business publisher, don't you? It's the Financial Times to print us all. So I said, then, diversity is a business issue. And I was very naive about newspaper cuttings, about gender equality, and about age and culture. So she saw I was keen. So she said to me, OK, I can see you're keen. If you sell 1,000 books, we'll publish. I said to her, how do I sell a thousand books I haven't written? So I gave up my job in the charity, and I went back to my family's garden in Bedfordshire. I was in the garden thinking, how do I sell a thousand books I haven't written? What would you do? You ask my friends to buy them, they don't love me that much. <laughs> so I thought one thing I can do is ask the company to buy them. So which company? Let me think. I'll try, I'll try the police. They're the community department. So I called the police. So I've got a good idea for a book. Will you sponsor a thousand books? They said, send an email. So I sent them an email. And to my surprise, they said, yes, we'll buy a thousand books. So I'm jumping up and down in the garden. I sold a thousand books I haven't written. And let me give Rachel a call. Rachel, I sold the books. Will you now publish? And the line went quiet. Stephen, we're surprised, but we're sorry. Commercially, it's not viable. You need to sell 4,000 books. So I, I said, okay. No, you need to know when to kill a project. So I went to Indonesia. I worked in um, Jakarta and Bogor on some community projects. And so I recruited back to England by a bank. And the woman from Human Resources that was interviewing me said, Stephen, you start so many things, but you don't finish any of them, do you? She said, you're not allowed to do a master's degree, you're not allowed to do any training courses till you finish your book. 
So I don't know if that's happened to you, but I've been told. So I interviewed a rocket scientist. Who else should I meet? I interviewed a baroness. Who else should I meet? I interviewed a female comedian. Who else should I meet? I interviewed a range of people. Still no book. And this is where the story ends. I was in a conference similar to this. It was in Old Street. And there was a buffering lunch queue. And every, um, there was one man in the queue who was sneezing everywhere. And everybody was avoiding him. Why? It was the days of the swine flu. So I went up to him. I said, my name's Stephen. and my name's Angela. He was Italian. He's a senior manager. He had two boys. He's a trusted English in the orchestra. And eventually he said to me, what do you do? He said, I want to write a book to inspire young people. He said, Stephen, my manager's interested in this topic. So I said to him, will you introduce me to your manager? Essential success? 50. Yeah. His manager was the HR director of EDF Energy, one of the largest power companies in France and or the UK. He sponsored that he had come over to Britain from Jamaica as, a, as an eight year old boy. He sponsored the 3,000 copies. We finished the book together, and before we finished, 8,000 were free for schools. It was a rocket science, but it's something of the simple principles that I've talked to within in this short time together. So to finish, and we've got one minute left because we need to go into the next speaker. But with your partner, just to turn to your neighbour, what were you, did you learn or remind yourself in the last, in this session? And what one thing will you do differently to develop your skills? One minute with your partner, and then I'll hand you back to the If you've done that, and I'll make a judgment on one of the best stories I've received. So, 
Enjoy the rest of your conference. My pleasure. I'd like to thank Lydia, who looked after me so well, and um, Dan and David for inviting me. Thank you.